Good morning. Good morning. Well, thanks for uh, joining me today. And first of all, uh, I want to congratulate you and your team on raising $40 million Series A venture funding round. And I'm, of course, as a um, World in Keller's perspective, we are very proud to be investing in your, your, your company along with some very well-known biotech venture capitalists at Prime and Bestimer. Uh, World in Keller's is, of course, very interested in the intersection of uh, biology and IT. Uh, by combining two, we believe we can be able to accelerate development of health and discovery of, of uh, new drugs by using data and AI. Uh, so I'm going to ask you a, a bit around your background. You are a physicist turned entrepreneur, you know, passionately committed to uh, addressing the intrinsically disordered proteins. You found the Peptin, the molecular computational physics company, focused on protein drug discovery. So uh, before we dive into fascinating world of proteins, could you please introduce yourself about uh, how you got to where you are, your background, and what inspired you to start the company? Um, thank you very much for, for the congratulations. I really appreciate it. And I just want to mention that this is the fault of the whole amazing team that we have, and not just mine, but I accept the congratulations on the, on the behalf of the whole team. Um, my name is Kamil Tsami. I'm a physicist. Um, I'm, I'm Polish. I was born in Poland. I, I've been always fascinated by physics, and I've been especially fascinated by the fact that you can use the language of mathematics to describe the natural world, yes? And my whole academic curriculum evolved around certain aspects of physics, but, you know, as, as we say, the more you eat, the hungry, the hungry you get. The more I started actually digging into biotechnology curriculum, I very quickly also discovered that what I find the most fascinating is actually proteins and the world of proteins and all the physical rules which govern the world of proteins. So I adjusted my academic curriculum to study more the proteins. I think the breakthrough for me scientifically and as far as, as value creation kind of mindset goes was ending up in the University of Groningen in the Netherlands where I was working in the group of molecular dynamics which pioneered lots of techniques in simulating proteins but also lots of techniques in studying them experimentally using a very bewildering technique called enema spectroscopy, which uses very big magnets to study motions of the proteins. And only over there, I discovered that, that you can actually probe the motions of the proteins on the molecular level experimentally, not just in the simulations. And to my surprise, and that was a surprise at the time, see that there is very big discrepancy between what the simulation actually does and experiment. So my whole PhD evolved around figuring out how to minimize the difference between this experimental discrepancy and the calculations and trying to answer a very simple question. If you give me a protein which wobbles a lot and doesn't have a structure, and if I would simulate it, why do I see a different outcome? Where is it coming from? Is it the shortcoming of computational technique? Or there's a force which we didn't account for, which demonstrates itself in experiment, and somehow we have to reconcile in the calculation. And truth to be told, that was the founding idea of Pepton. Simultaneously, what has been happening in the scientific world was the notion that protein structures, protein structures don't entirely encode their functions. There, the notion that there is a universe of molecules which don't necessarily have a structure, but either functionally and biologically relevant and functional. So there was a rapid emergence of a field of intrinsically disordered proteins powered by incredible research coming from Cambridge, Copenhagen, um, also Groningen, Weizmann Institute in Israel, yes. I mean, reconciling calculations, NMR spectroscopy, and all this bewildering protein science of disordered proteins has become my obsession. The, the, the question around this whole area that are really converging and changing it is something that are happening very new because of the, uh, the computation is available and we're learning a lot more about the combination of technology and IT and data that can be able to inference what we do. Um, and so I'm just curious about why now the floodgate seems to be open and I'd like to understand yes. the background around this. Fantastic, thank you so much. This is an excellent question. 
we are living in amazing times. And so there, we are living at the very convergence of multiple things happening simultaneously. The first thing that you said, Young, very rightfully so is, you know, we are getting to the level where we can run very, very, very long simulations of proteins, which are very important for us to understand their biological function and also their molecular behavior. And this has been greatly facilitated by emergence of supercomputing, HPC, revolution powered by companies like NVIDIA, Samsung, that, you know, create a hardware which actually propels this. But there is a second very, very, very important fact too. The cost of sequencing whole genomes has gone down tremendously in the last 10 years, from I would say thousands of dollars to hundreds of dollars. And it means that the rate at which we can deliver the data that we can then feed and simulate actually is unprecedented on the scale of the whole, I would say, molecular sciences. And then we have a third factor. Smart people, smart people at DeepMind, smart people at Google, at Facebook, at Novartis, um, in academia, who actually said, you know what? We can deploy this machine learning models, which always suffered from inaccuracy, low performance, ridiculous training costs on this wealth of the data to look for new biological insights. So we have a, you have a convergence of three things, which by large, very, for very long time, lived their own lives. Yes. AI was living the life of computer game. This is where it was actually the most sophisticated. Yes. Uh, it was a bewildering, bewildering set of academic projects and the major Craig venture. Yes. Human genome project, kind of uh, human genome sequencing project and the computing which was serving a variety of purposes. And here we are in the last five years, what you see is all of these things converging. Where people say, I'm not going to start a company that is good at computing. I'm going to start a company which does computing, does cutting edge high throughput experiments, and develops proprietary software on top of that to make a sense out of them. And that's essentially foundational idea of Pepton. Obviously, uh, these disciplines like biology and medicine has been separate from, in a way, the IT, now you can really see the combination and intersection is really making changes and, and accelerating the pace of innovation. And of course, in the outcome of that will have a much bigger impact. So let's talk about end in mind. If you are very successful in doing what you're doing, and if you are successful in your journey, what would be the outcome that you love to see that can impact the world? I, I would like to see people living longer, children not dying of, of, of diseases which were curable and understandably vastly improved care for patients with cancer. Excellent. So uh, basically, the, particularly in this area, you're trying to bring order to disorder the, the structure uh, through the uh, modeling and simulations and others that can accelerate the uh, pace of innovation in this area. Can you tell me, tell us more about what that is? Yes, absolutely. So, um, as you rightfully said, Young, by no means proteins are static. Like everything else in this universe, they, they have kinetic energy, means they are moving. Some proteins just wobble and oscillate around their what we call equilibrium structures and they're structural proteins in your cell. But most of the proteins actually move, tumble, interact with others. You have enzymes, you have signaling proteins. It's the motion of these proteins that holds a key to understanding their function. And it's emotional lack of thereof, which very often is related to pathology. Our company is focusing specifically on the proteins which if you would isolate them and studying them in vitro, seem like they don't have any structure. They're very bewildering, but they have a one very peculiar property. When you put them back in a cell, they have ability to actually assume a structure and use the structure and its dynamics to actually propagate signals in the cell. They can be part of a cytoskeleton of the cell or extracellular matrix. So what Pepton does is we are looking and assembling incredibly powerful and cost-effective experimental workflows around these proteins. And we are complementing and supplementing these workflows with supercomputing. And why is that? Experiments alone are not enough to explain how these proteins behave. But simulations, on the other hand, are not mature enough to provide the real picture of what these proteins do. 
And it's only the convergence and intersection which allows you to build as physically realistic images of what these proteins really are. And most importantly, what is the most plausible strategy of minimizing the risk of dragging them? I just want to mention here that there's no more risk, let's say, um, taking industry than pharma is. The chance of a small molecule succeeding is only 5%, with the cost ranging from hundreds to, let's say, $2.3 billion per drug. Imagine how much risk our collaborators and colleagues at pharma are taking. So the question is, could we, as a company specialized in preclinical research, so the first phases, model this risk, understand where the risk is coming from, and deploy capital in a clever way to mitigate this risk for a collaborator to take this asset to clinics? And, you know, speaking in the language of science and a little bit of, uh, I would say, capital allocation, you want to become a data and science driven capital allocator in pharma. When you say, I want to help the patients and I want to allocate capital on this project because we know so much about it that the chance of success is the highest. It's interesting to hear from you about the, uh, the, the cost and difficulty of uh, discovery. So um, the industry that I'm familiar with which is really the microelectronics and semiconductors that are driven last 30 years based on the uh, Moore's law, which is really about the ability to predict the density and cost and power of transistors. They can be able to double and yet being able to maintain the cost and reduce the power. Uh, and in, in, hand, in many ways that has benefited humankind by being able to have a supercomputers not on the big buildings, but in your pockets, in your mobile experience, with it connected in the cloud, right? That wasn't, wasn't possible 30 years ago. Today, it is given, and all, uh, in fact, uh, most of the uh, people on Earth have mobile phones, even the countries that are really poor, that is, essence, having a supercomputers in their pocket. Great, uh, in a way, the uh, tools for democratizing the world because now they have the connectivity, they have information, they can do microfinancing. So these are all great things that are really uh, benefiting all of us. But the benefit happened because of the more slow observation that is being able to reduce cost and power over time, along with the uh, improving density that are to the degree of 100 billion transistors can be on one in my big microprocessor chips. I think in drug discovery has been the other way, right? I think the cost of drug discovery has been doubling every year. So it's inverse of more slow. And I, I'm just curious about how, our, and I think you're commenting on that as well. There's a lot of waste of R&D dollars. They cannot be able to successfully target. Do you see that uh, trend changing or how do you see this uh, uh, interaction between the cost of drug discovery versus the benefits and the difficulty of this journey? I mean, this is a very great, op this is really good observation. You're absolutely spot on. And there are more and more big scientific and also commercial outlets reporting on the drop in efficiency of R&D, as they call it. Yes, Aram's law, as they call it, inverse of Moore's law, just, just to make it funny. But we have to, as a scientist, let let let's alone. Let, let let us you know leave the role of CEO right now. As the scientists, let's ask, ask ourselves the question: Where is this lack of efficiency coming from? It is coming from the fact that our colleagues in pharma, and I salute them here, they work with more and more complex problems to crack, and they are working with systems of biological complexity which increases exponentially. So imagine that you are probing a new science with the tools which were from twenty five years ago. So first of all, the research is underpowered because of a lack of a sophisticated tools and the pace of discovering the tools is slower and lagging behind. The second thing is also that what we have to embrace is because people in the field and also venture capitalists recognize this problem, there is capital going to companies which actually are reversing this trend by minimizing the cost of experiments. Very good example of a company which I respect and I really love is Recursion Therapeutics, who actually build a platform that can do 
cytoimaging as a function of excipients, molecular compounds, which is fully automated and generates vast amounts of data, catalogs them, analyzes them, minimizing the cost of, of search for a fact of a drug per experiment. Yes? So there is a recognition of the fact that experiments are expensive and everybody wants the cost of failure to be lower and lower. Yes. And the final thing is, and let's be honest, pharma is a, is a business like every other business driven by cost benefit analysis by large based on, based on, you know, incentives, which big companies have to innovate. And it's very often left to us, smaller players or emerging players, to help with the R&D and form ways of collaboration which enhance the output of R&D, while, of course, making sure that there is value creation for all the stakeholders. So what I'm trying to say by all that I just said is, sadly, the problem of farm, the pharma faces is very complex science allocation of capital and existence of different stakeholders who all have to collaborate on actually increasing this efficiency. That's why existence of a healthy venture capital ecosystem is paramount. And that's why I'm very thankful to have you and Walden, Bessemer, F Prime, Novartis, Hoxton Ventures. I'm so happy, D Plus Ventures. I'm so happy of having you on board because without your support, people like us pushing the boundary on efficiency, risk management, lowering the cost of experiment would never come to the table because the biggest players don't have incentive to do it. So let's talk a little bit about the, there's some headlines gaining lately, right? The uh, particularly Google's DeepMind team has the, uh, this Alpha Fold uh, 2, I think, gaining a lot of attention and uh, attraction for their announcement, their ability to uh, synthesize or actually being able to model and then be able to predict protein structures in a very record time than ever. So I'd like to get your perspective of what this means and the, uh, where are we in terms of State of Union and what are some of the challenges in this particular um, what we call protein structure prediction capabilities that are driven based on data and AI algorithm. Absolutely. Um, so first of all, I, I think this is a, a fantastic development. And it's a fantastic development from, I believe, from the one angle which is not widely discussed in press. This development demonstrates that well-funded and organized team in a private company can make cutting leading research, something which people didn't believe would existed 15 years ago when you always thought, well, in academia, they do great research and then companies buy it. You see what I mean? Now, for us at Pepton, we love this development because it's a great hiring tool where we say, hey, we are well capitalized. We are smart people. Come and, you know, come from academia to us. Let's do great science. Look at DeepMind. We can do great science. So that's one thing. And I just wanted to mention this first because it never gets the right headlines of recognition. On the approach itself, it's cutting edge. It is essentially few levels above everything that was out there that people believe was really cutting edge at the time. And I think DeepMind team has to be highly commented. Is it game changing to the level that people claim? No. And the reason why is, first of all, it's not a method that predicts protein folding. It's a method that predicts structures. Protein folding is a separate, very complex process. It's a reaction of protein acquiring structure. Second thing is, many of the proteins which DeepMind models, the structures or the models of them are not accurate enough for high resolution drug discovery. And still you have to do a lot of experiments. But, what is incredibly important is that, as you mentioned, at the pace and the scale not attainable before, you can very quickly get a relatively reasonable model of a protein to start with and build scientific hypothesis. When you think about the method that way, by all means, it is something that is incredibly exciting. This method will have a lot of application for studying large molecular assemblies and for example, modeling complexes from cryo-electron microscopy, where you have large assemblies, low resolution, and you want to fit protein models in it. And I think the biggest impact of the method will be seen over there. And I think there are already very many high impact, highly cited papers, which clearly demonstrate the relative benefit of DeepMind's method versus anything out there. Our company focus on the problems and proteins 
which cannot be modeled because of the inherited dynamics. And they cannot be also modeled because the computational methods which we have that, that we try to deploy to model these proteins, they're insufficient because of the level of theory that we're actually using them. So we are creating company which at best integrates thus integrative computing with experiments. And truth to be told, because of the things which I addressed before, and that is complexity of biological systems, even singular proteins, I still believe times where we're going to be able to confidently model behavior of singular protein completely end-to-end -end are still ahead of us. You have developed uh, this uh, platform called Oppenheimer, which is a protein modeling platform that can transform this undruggable, intrinsically disordered proteins into developable drug candidates. So tell us more about your unique approach. About the platform itself. What we've done is, first of all, we capitalize, and I just want to once again bow to all my colleagues in the field, on 25 years of incredible academic research into disordered proteins and understanding what works and what that didn't work experimentally and why. The platform is born out of very pragmatic notion of integrating all these experimental techniques, which are not very expensive, have a limited resolution, but can be turned into high throughput approach. And the whole notion is, what's the, if you were to be given an intrinsically disordered protein of any type, let's say of 200 residues long, what's the cheapest and the fastest way to get enough experimental restraints to, to validate your molecular simulations and to create as reasonable representation of what the system does in your sample tube? That's what Oppenheimer is. And that's why in that sense, it integrates variety of experimental techniques which were believed to be cutting edge for, for uh, intrinsically disordered proteins, but it does this in a clever way, meaning that some of these techniques are too expensive and too quirky to fully utilize their potential. You, you actually settle with a low resolution, quick and dirty, I would say, approach, but because you use computer and many techniques, you can beautifully and elegantly reconstruct what the behavior of the protein is. And then if you do confirmatory experiment, for example, with NMR spectroscopy, you see that actually what you model makes sense, it's high quality, and then you say, well, that's great. I made an experiment which is 1,000 times cheaper than what, what experiment, what, what would be the cost of experiment in NMR given the time, complexity, operators, technician, sample labeling, and variety of things. So that's what Oppenheimer is. And in that sense, Young, the mission is never done. In that sense, you always have to read go to conferences, see what people do. We have our own original R&D, but you always have to be open to innovation and always have to be open to, um, to things, to flow of ideas, information. That's why Oppenheimer is never done. So uh, it is a platform that are learning and being able to provide feedback and being able to adjust based on the changes that are happening, I guess. Yes, and, and that's why computationally, it's a platform which is modeled after microservice architectures, where you have a set of tools which you can very quickly repurpose to build powerful workflows. And these workflows has to be customized to a type of a disordered protein you work on, because you may have a fully disordered proteins, partially disordered proteins, folded proteins with disordered domains. Yes, the fact is, there's not a single tool that does it all. And we embrace that, and from the very beginning, Coming from this field, we said, if we design a platform, we need to be able to have a variety of workloads, which we can repurpose very quickly in a clever way. But I want to change the discussion to about you, about your career and how you become from the academic, uh, from scientist, now you're CEO, entrepreneur. How is the transition? How is the journey for you? Um, it is, besides having a child, this is the best experience of my life, honestly. Um, and it, it, I'm incredibly grateful for this experience and I'm incredibly grateful for ability to work with people like you, learn from you and learn from mentors, which I have industry mentors and incredible investors that essentially provide me a lot of guidance and, and you know, you just soak the knowledge. Um, it is an incredible experience because I do science that I love I work on problems that I would work on nonetheless, even if I work for a pharma company. And finally, I work with people that I really like and respect. And if you add all of these factors together, 
And there are ups and downs. Oh my God, everybody who listens to me, who raised money, who is building their company, does struggles that nobody knows about. Nobody writes in their blog articles or, you know, Fortune magazine. Let's be honest, they are. But if you look on the upside potential of an impact that a small team can do and a dent you can really inflict in the field we are, all of these things are secondary. About my own experience, Indeed, my transition started in a very bizarre way. I am obsessed about mountains and I have been always obsessed about mountaineering. And I promised myself that I would spend more time in the mountains. <laughs> and why I've been in the Netherlands, the flattest country in the world, <laughs> yes, with minus four meters the, below the sea level. That's actually the province of Groningen where I live. I, I, I really develop a passion for photographing. And I started photo photographing my friends during different climbing excursions in the Alps, in uh, Ardennes, in different mountain ranges. And I naively started sending these photos to different climbing outlets, just seeing uh, if people would like them. And people really started liking them. And this very quickly turned, this passion turned into a small business of which I had on the side while doing academic research, which started yielding more and more money actually to the level where photos started being featured by lots of news outlets, National Geographic, Atlantic, New York Times, and other places. And there was a certain moment where I got approached by Facebook. And I got a call from Facebook and they were making something which was called Do What You Love. It was, an, an, it was a storytelling exercise that Mark Zuckerberg made for Facebook internally to bring influencers on social media who transitioned thanks to Facebook into professional career and they featured me. Storytelling is indispensable for raising capital and building meaningful company. Storytelling, in our case, scientific storytelling, is indispensable to, to explaining and vocalizing the vision of the company and making sure that all the people from different walks of life, like a one symphonic orchestra, follow the flow and focus. And if I may say, if I'm incredibly grateful for photography experience with all ups and downs, because it gave me a sense, what does it mean to be living on your own budget? It taught me certain fiscal discipline, but finally prepared me for storytelling. One-on-one -on -one deal making, when you have to negotiate your own deal, you don't have an agent, you have to do it on your own. And there are very many parallels with, with actually raising capital, building a venture. Yes, with once again, with ups and downs. So this is in short my story and I'm, I would, I've made lots of mistakes in the journey. Oh gosh, many. But you know what? Given where I am right now, I will never ever do things differently. Because it's just like Jobs said, Steve Jobs, you can only connect the dots backwards. Next Wave Speakers is really about sharing the stories of entrepreneurs and CEOs. And, and we want to we wanna share these values. And I think you're sharing some of your really interesting personal stories along with your great a modeling platform that I think hopefully someday can contribute to really helping all of us live better because at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. So Kamil, I want to thank you for your participation today. I wish you a, um, first of all, I'm really excited we're in this journey together to make the difference. And the, uh, I think with your leadership, your passion, I believe we will make an impact and we can inspire other entrepreneurs to join in to participate in this, what I call, journey for better living. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Young. That was really a pleasure, and I wish you uh, also a wonderful week. Great. Have a great day.